So we've got a few to go. Uh, this is titled, By Their Fruits. And this is the discussion tonight about being, being aware and, and uh, uh, cautious and discerning of false prophets and false teachers. So I'm going to read the passage, which is verses 15 through 20 of chapter 7. And we'll ask the Lord to help us in our time together tonight. Um, Matthew 7, 15 to 20. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, you will recognize them by their fruits. Heavenly Father, we pray and ask for your guidance tonight. By the work of your spirit in us, would you make known the text? Would you teach, us to, teach it to us tonight, Lord, through the words that I speak? Uh, would you use me as a mouthpiece to convey your text faithfully tonight, Lord? And may all of us together be those who receive your word and act upon it. Help us to be doers of the word, Lord, hearing and doing, obeying the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray in his name. Amen. So last week we talked about the narrow path. We uh, discussed that there is only uh, one gate. There is only one way to the Father, only one way to heaven. That is through the person of Jesus Christ. We also discussed how this, the narrowness of this path didn't mean that there's only going to be a few people in eternity, but Jesus speaking very clearly to a Jewish context that there was only going to be a few at this particular time. We looked and we, we zoomed out to all of Scripture to be able to see the great promises of God of the, that were given right back to Abraham, of the stars in the sky, um, that there will be many, many coming to faith. And so um, those who are, however, on this narrow path that we call Christianity, or those who have entered in via the narrow gate through Jesus Christ, that is, are given this further instruction of be aware and beware of false prophets, as Jesus says here. And he says, they come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. And he asked this these rhetorical questions are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles so in the old testament period the greatest threat to the israelites was actually not the armies that surrounded them at, at, at the moment we're going through some sermons on on judges and we're seeing that israel have enemies around them other armies other nations conquering them and uh, at war with them but the biggest issue that Israel had was themselves. Their threats came from within. They came from their own hearts, their own idolatry, their own issues. Um, and God would regularly give them over um, to these nations that would oppress them because of their disobedience. But at the same time that God would do this to bring them to repentance and bring them back, God would then give them victory over these armies um, as they repented and turned and lived obediently to the Lord. In a similar way, however, the, the biggest threat always for the church is not outside forces that come in upon the church. The, the threat that we have comes from within the church, inside the body of Christ. Those who sneak in, uh, in wolves, uh, uh, dressed as sheep, sorry, but they are inside, they are ravenous wolves, as we read in the text here. And we think about uh, even the, the period of time where we saw the government clamping down on churches and telling you you couldn't sit next to your family member and we saw them telling you couldn't sing songs to God and all this sort of stuff and raised our concerns, of course, and uh, there was some things to say no to and to stand boldly against those things, not to just go along with those things. But the biggest threat to the church is not the big bad government, particularly not for us here in the West, it will be the people that are inside the room who abandon the word of God, the ones who will cause division and fight amongst themselves and ultimately neglect God's commandments and cause issues. So Jesus says, beware. He means business when he says this. He seeks to capture the attention of the listener with a warning, beware. It's not always going to be easy and nice. Beware. 
And he says, beware of what? Beware of false prophets. Prophet is one, of course, who speaks on behalf of God. They speak the words of God. When we think about the book of Isaiah and the the, the prophet Isaiah spoke, he spoke the very words coming from God. These were the words then to be taken seriously because it wasn't just some uh, raving lunatic getting up and saying something. It was God speaking through his chosen prophet. The Old Testament prophets are very mouthpieces and there's many prophets in the Old Testament. Uh, as scripture speaks to us today, as the word of the Lord, the, the prophet spoke as one from God. Thus saith the Lord. So to hear a prophet was to hear directly from God. And so a false prophet then is one who claims to be speaking from God, of God, yet they are not. They come with their own agenda and they sneak in amongst the people of God. They will deceive and they will lead astray the people of God. So if a, a, a prophet was false, not from God, yet claimed to be, you would know because of the contradiction of the scriptures, of the Old Testament, of the Torah, of the law of God. There would be a knowledge of this because they would be speaking something that was not found in the scriptures themselves. What they spoke then did not come to pass is also how you knew them to be a false prophet. Because they would say that they were speaking from God and they would give a prophecy or a prediction, but it would not come to pass. And so therefore they were a false prophet. That's what happens when you say, God is telling me to say this, and it doesn't come to pass, you are a false prophet. How do you think that God would deal with false prophets? Do you think he would have one of the elders of, the, of Israel sit them down and just take them through a bit of a process of let's work out, you know, how you can no longer be a false prophet? Maybe point out the the prophecies and say that they were, you know, this didn't come to pass. Maybe they put them under some church discipline for a little while and, and instruct them and, and do this. Well, let's find out. How did God deal with false prophets in the Old Testament? Let's turn to Deuteronomy chapter 18. Deuteronomy 18, we're going to look at verse 20. Now remember, this belongs to the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, the law of God. And so the Israelites were to live according to the law of God. They had to do what was written here in the text. It says, but the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name that I have not commanded him to speak... Or one who speaks in the name of other gods, that same prophet shall die. So the prophet who is false was put to death. They were up there with the murderers, the rapists, the blasphemers and the adulterers whose crimes, whose law breaking was punishable by death. The sin was so severe in light of the righteousness and the holiness of God that death, therefore, was the fitting punishment for being a false prophet. So keep that in mind the next time you're searching through the internet, looking at crazy videos, or they just happen to pop up on YouTube, and you hear some person saying, the Lord has just given me a word for you. The Lord has just put a word in my heart, a word in season, uh, as, as some might like to say, and claim to be speaking from God. Now, there's a lot of grace right now in this, in this new covenant period for false prophets and false, false teachers. A lot of grace. They, they do not get put to death, but this was the punishment. This is how severe we should take it. It raises a question for us. Was God unjust? Was God um, wrong to put people to death for being false prophets? Well, what's your understanding of sin? What's your understanding of the wickedness of, of human um, sin in light of the holiness and the righteousness of God. If you think that God is unjust when he puts people to death, then you probably don't realize how bad sin is. That's, that's the reality. If you think, if you read stuff and you think, oh, that's just, you know, God's been like a tyrant here. No, God has been a just God, a just judge. And the fitting punishment is this. We live in this time of the new covenant and there is much grace. God is 
um, holding back his righteous wrath against sin. But when we read it in light of this, this is the same, this is the very same God. He has not looked back on his old ways and said, oh, I think I need to ease up a little bit here. He has redirected his righteous wrath against sinners and given it to Jesus Christ at the cross. That is why we are operating in this period of grace. So this is what we see here, a a word of warning about false prophets. And Jesus uses sheep and wolves to describe the situation. He says, they come to you in sheep's clothing, but they are wolves. So the, the sheep metaphors are very, very good here. These illustrations that Jesus gives are very relevant Um, For this time period, particularly, very relatable to his audience. People are workers of the land. They are farmers. They know sheep. Uh, It's a regular part of the life of many that Jesus is speaking to. So there's a very relatable uh, uh, approach here in talking about uh, being sheep and, and having wolves because people understand very much that if you have sheep, you have to protect them from the wolves who come in to devour. They, they get this illustration. But secondly, the illustration extends to the reality that God calls us his sheep. That's who we are. Christ himself is the good shepherd. And so this should have our minds going to Psalm 23, where we're thinking about the Lord who is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures, right? The emphasis of the psalm is where he leads us and he protects us. His rod that comforts us, it it guides us. He brings us out of the thicket and keeps us on track, right? This is the the, the shepherd. And of course, then we should be taking this to John chapter 10 as we consider, well, who is this good shepherd exactly? It is Jesus Christ. Uh, John 10 reads, truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. Here's Jesus referring to himself again as a door. He uses this often, door, gate. There's only one of them. There's only one way to come in. And it says, but he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him, the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. We are the sheep. The people of God, the true believer in Jesus Christ, uh, we are the sheep. So in verse 7, it says, So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and robbers, robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go on uh, and out to find pasture. Verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. He's not concerned about the sheep because he's a, he, he is not the good shepherd. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. Verse 13 says, he flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. Jesus says in verse 14, I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not in this fold. I must bring them also. They will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd, Jesus Christ. One people. That's Jew and Gentile. One flock, one church, one body of Christ and one shepherd. So Jesus is this. He is the the shepherd of the flock the people of God, and he is very good. He is the very good shepherd. However, at the same time that we take comfort in this, there are wolves, and we must be aware of this. That is why Jesus says, beware, because he doesn't want you to fall victim to the wolf. He doesn't want you to be led astray by false teachers and false prophets. So he puts this warning in Scripture, preserved, the breathed out and inspired word of God, preserved for all time, for all of his people. Why? Just to be something to reflect on? No, to warn you that there are people wanting to deceive you with their words and their teaching. And this is the reality of the wolf is that we will understand that they do not come in with a sign upon their head saying, wolf, beware. They do not come in with sharp teeth that we might see them and go, look out guys, we've just had a wolf come in. That's why they're wearing sheep's clothing, because they are disguised. They look like believers. They look like Christians. They look just like you look. 
they will use Christian language. So they come in and it's not easy to pick up because they're wearing this sheep's clothing. They will use Christian language. They will look and sound Christian. They will even say the name of Jesus. They'll speak positively and some of them will be the nicest people that you've ever encountered. No sharp teeth visible whatsoever. They will be right there amongst the sheep, disguised. And so the warning that Jesus gives is they come in sheep's clothing, but inwardly. This is why you can't see it on the outside and even in some of the words that are being spoken, because inwardly is where it is taking place. And inwardly, they are ravenous wolves, dressed, sounding, looking Christian, but they are inwardly wolves despite the appearance. So when a person says the name of Jesus or says, I'm a Christian, and they claim to be a Christian, do you have the kind of discernment that you need to have to be able to not just jump in and, and, and think that this is, this is all going to go just fine, or do you have discernment in your life to be able to examine, because we are called to test the fruit, to see if the spirit that has come is the spirit of God. Is there any caution in you whatsoever or is it just because somebody said they're a Christian and said they love Jesus that you were just on board right from the very beginning? Do you go onto, onto YouTube and see sermons? Do you have the ability to go, that thing there was not from the Bible? Do you have that? Or do you just go, oh, there's preaching and, and, and it's a prophecy and oh, I get, I'm so excited. There's some Christian content on here and you just start to absorb it and take it all in because it apparently was Christian. Or do you have discernment? A Christian must have discernment. We, we understand that initially new believers will need to grow in maturity of faith. This is why being in the word is so necessary. It's always such a, a, a struggle it seems to be that pastors have and, and Christians who love the word of God have always got this wrestle with these apparent believers who never open the Bible. The only time that the Bible gets opened is on a Sunday when somebody else opens it for them. Is this just laziness or is this very person just not a Christian at all? We have to ask these types of questions because a Christian loves the Word of God. And although we might not have perfect Bible reading all the time and, and there's, uh, there's various seasons that we go through, a, a true believer desires to be hearing from God in, in, in His Word. So do you have the kind of discernment that you need or have you grown dull of hearing? I remember a guy uh, a, a number of years ago and he was talking to me and he was, a, he was in two very different contexts of church. And I was, I was baffled by it because one church service that he was going to was the lights, the smoke machines. It was the super energetic uh, preaching where you don't really use the Bible whatsoever. You just give a feel-good message and occasionally you refer to a scriptural passage. But ultimately, you're just giving a positive message to get people hyped up. That was the type of church that, that I knew that he was going to. And on the other off week, he was going to a different church or an evening service as it was. And in that church setting, there was no lights and, and big show, but there was exegetical preaching of opening the word and just going line by line uh, teaching the Bible. And I said to him, what do you notice about the difference? And he was able to point out that the worship was a bit different. Well, that was good. He was able to say, well, in one place there's... It's like a big band. It's like a rock concert in one. And in the other one, it seems to be a bit, you know, just, just quieter, a bit, more, a bit more simple. I said, well, what about the preaching, though? Are you, do you see any difference in the preaching? And he said to me, no, they just, they're the same, really. And I said, are you reading your Bible and understanding what preaching is supposed to be? How can you not see the difference between a motivational message with a couple of Jesuses thrown in and a sermon that is preached to line by line exegetically to proclaim the word of God for the people, to feed the flock. He didn't have discernment. I believe him to be a true believer, but there was no discernment. Friend, you have to be able to do this. You have to grow and study the word of God in order to be able to make the discernment that is necessary. You must not be led away into uh, all of the the crazy world that is out there in, in, in YouTube land, you need to be able to line things up with the word of God. Why? Because there are false prophets 
and there are wolves and they will lead you astray. If you are not trained and equipped, they will lead you astray. And you will end up a believer, yes, but full of a bunch of junk. You will start reciting the same garbage that comes out from these guys and you will start to produce not much fruit. There will be not much fruit coming from your life in regards to this. You'll be stifled by false teaching. That's how sickening this stuff is. It will hold you back from growth in the Lord. So we need to be discerning. The, the wolves that come, they are dressed as Christians. And that's the main point here. You have to understand, as you hear the word wolf, and I get it, you think, big scary creature coming in. Think, really, really nice looking Christian is what we're supposed to have here. They are dressed as Christians, they present as Christians. But inwardly, they are here to devour you. They are ravenous wolves. They come for the destruction of the flock. They will eat you, not physically, but they will consume you with their false teaching, their disunity, and their false words. So if they dress Christian, how are we supposed to know? That's the question now. We've got these uh, wolves dressed in sheep's clothing. We're not going to be able to pick it up with the eye. How are we supposed to know? Jesus says right here, you will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So it is the fruit, and we've looked at the fruit of the Spirit tonight as we've prayed. It is the fruit that comes from their lives that will give you evidence about where they are at. Does a person, and just leaving aside the concept of false prophet for a moment, but does a person tell you that they're, they're a Christian and then you look at their life and there is absolutely no fruit coming from their, their proclamation of Christ? They, they, they say they're a Christian and if you, if you get them in a conversation, this is what they'll tell you, yet you are with them, you know them, you see their life and there is no fruit coming from their life whatsoever. They could care less about the body of Christ. They could care less about reading God's word and obeying it. You want to walk away from that situation then going, oh, I still think they're a Christian though. You are to observe and examine the fruit and think I'm really concerned for this person's salvation. I think what I need to do is preach the gospel to them. But when it comes to these false prophets, you will know them also by their fruits. Observe. Pray, for God, pray to God for discernment if you don't have it. No matter what a false prophet or a wolf says, they will not be able to produce Christian fruit. They won't produce wisdom that is in line with the word of God. They won't produce true godly fruit of the spirit. They will give the appearance, but they do not have it. Be careful with those, though, because some of those things will trick you. For instance, today, it's easy to get tricked that goodness means niceness or kindness means niceness. A, a wolf will be nice. Some are possibly the nicest people around. They have fruit that'll trick you. It'll look like fruits of the Spirit, but it won't be that kind of fruit. Nice, but not really Christian. You might mistake goodness for various gifts that they give you, trying to win you over with uh, tickling, tickling your, your ears with words and, and giving you gifts to draw you in. You will know them by the fruit that comes from their lives. Is what they are saying and the words that are coming out of their mouth in line with Holy Scripture? And that's where you need the word yet again. To come back and see, is what I'm hearing what I'm seeing in the text? Is what this person is proclaiming and uh, where is the, the focus here? Is this taking me towards discipleship and knowing Jesus through the word? Or is this somebody else's plan and agenda that is being presented? Jesus continues with his illustration here about fruit. He says, so every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. So if the inward person is rotten, wicked, it means that regeneration has not taken place, making this person a new person from the inside out. Is that how, that's how it has to happen. Uh, a, the Christian life begins within, the, the transformation. It is the Spirit of God acting upon a person, taking them from death to life, um, taking out the, the heart of stone and giving them a heart of flesh, putting His Spirit within them and causing them to walk in His statutes. So regeneration has not occurred. They are rotten within. They still have the heart of stone. And so therefore, the stuff that comes from them 
if you consider them to be a tree, it's, it's diseased fruit that they are putting out. It's diseased because its core is rotten. The tree itself is rotten. And Jesus says a healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit. So a true believer, a true Christian is stumbling, yes. Uh, imperfect, yes. But they're going to produce good fruit. That is the way it works. Uh, throughout the course of their life, There'll be seasons of more fruit and there'll be times of struggle, of course, but the Christian person is going to bear fruit. They are going to give the, as we saw, fruit of the Spirit that we've looked at this evening. Why? Because the heart has been changed. The inside has been made new. And so the tree then is is healthy and good. And so what comes from it comes from a good and healthy place. Given this new heart with new desires, God has put his Spirit in them. He is causing them to love his word and walk in his word, in his will and in his commandments. Under the preaching of the word, they will submit themselves. This is how it happens as well. If you're a a, a true believer, you will yield to the preaching and the teaching of God's word. You will yield to what the scripture tells you. You will be humbled by the Bible. You will come to church services and you will... Um, hear the preaching of the word and it'll act upon your heart that you want to go out and obey. You don't sit there in the sermons of where where the Bible is being preached and hear the very words of God being spoken and sit there disagreeing with it. You don't sit there going, yeah, I would have done things a bit differently there. I would have done this. You know, like there is a yielding that takes place. You want to be the very person that's talked about in scripture who obeys Christ. You want to do what it takes to live a life worthy and pleasing of him. So the fruit is coming from a good place when a person is truly born again. We go into verses 19 and 20. It says, every tree that does not bear good fruit, it is cut down and it is thrown into the fire. Thus, you will recognize them by their fruits. Last week, I mentioned just how much in these evening services we talk about hell. So much. Not because it's my topic, it's Jesus' topic. Jesus wants to talk to people about hell regularly. One of the reasons I I think that that hell doesn't have the impact or speaking about it doesn't always have the impact, I think there's two two reasons I've observed. One is there's almost like a, a cartoon version of hell that's been presented in the West through media and movies. And, uh, We'll have comedies where somebody goes to hell and has a, 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 a bit of an adventure in this place, but they manage to get themselves back out of there. And all that sort of nonsense, what it does is it just brings down the severity of hell in somebody's mind. They, they think back to the, the, the Roman Catholic days and that they think about the times when the preaching of hell was used for you to give money. So someone would get up and they would preach hell, so you were scared, and they say... Put the money in here now. And so people now today reject it. Like, oh, you're using that to try and get our money. Or you're using that just to try and get us scared and do what we... So I think there's a whole bunch of things that have happened. And I think the other thing too is that churches have fallen away from preaching about hell. Hell should be in sermons often because Jesus spoke about hell often. And hell is horrible. We don't have extensive information about hell but it's eternal that's the first thing the the going to hell is in the sense that we talk about going to the new heavens and new earth going to heaven that's eternal right so is hell there is no end to the suffering there is no end to the torment and the the devastation of what hell is people make these jokes and these remarks about well if that's where Uncle Bob is, that's where I'll go too. You do not want to go where Uncle Bob is if he is truly there. Um, We need to take hell seriously. We need to preach it and not hold back from it. And are there going to be people that, you know, bring up some sort of, oh, you're this fire brimstone type of person or you're trying to use scare tech? Of course people are going to say stuff, but do you love them enough to warn them, hell is hot and you're going to go there if you reject Christ? It's, it's, the, it's the truth. It's the reality. Jesus actually uses hell to motivate people towards salvation. He does not hold back from saying, 
if you're going to live this lifestyle of sin, hell is where you're going to go. Why don't we do that? We should be doing that. If that's what Jesus did, if that was good for Jesus, then we should see Jesus uses hell as a motivator to get people to wake up to their sin and realize, I am headed for destruction. He teaches that not all who say they are Christian are truly Christian. In the end, there will be wolves in sheep's clothing, false prophets, false teachers, and there will be those who say, Lord, Lord, but do not enter the kingdom. He says this type of tree, this false prophet and this person who is a, 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 this tree that is not healthy, it's not right, it's not good, it's not a born again believer, right? As, as we're using the illustration, it's going to be cut down and thrown into the fire. And that is hell. They will be removed and they will be thrown, the, thrown into the lake of fire where they will suffer for eternity. But this extends then just from thinking about false prophets. It's the reality that every tree will be cut down that does not produce good fruit so jesus meek and mild jesus slowly and comforter of the children and lover of sheep also jesus the bold confrontational preacher who warns people the dangers of hell and he warns people about deception about false prophets and false teachers and we need to hear the warning again tonight we need to be reminded of the seriousness of hell for those who reject Christ. And we need to be reminded also of the fact that not everybody who claims Christ, not everybody who teaches, not everybody who comes with the word of the Lord, so to speak, is actually true and genuine. Um, so first thing is, uh, do you know them? And let's, let me just start at the mega church TV pastor level and I've, I've named names before, but it's right to do this because I love people enough to say, if you are listening to Joel Osteen, you are listening to a false teacher. Stop listening to Joel Osteen. He's nothing more than a motivational speaker who uses the word of God to make a, a, a load of money. If you are listening to Joyce Meyer, you need to stop listening to Joyce Meyer. Much of what Joyce Meyer says is actually accurate. She speaks truth of the word of God. And we should not be surprised by that and say, well, just because she speaks a lot, some truth does not mean that she can be trusted and, and, and followed after. Um, even Satan comes as an angel of light and she's for your money. She is a false teacher, a false prophet who preaches a prosperity gospel. She's to be rejected. Um, Stephen Furtick is to be rejected. He is under the instruction of T.D. Jakes self-proclaimed bishop T.D. Jakes who denies the trinity who uh, again is a prosperity teacher um, Stephen Furtick is following in his footsteps Todd White uh, Kenneth Copeland if you can't if you can't even just look at that guy and realize this is not right Benny Hinn it always surprised me with Benny Hinn right like really look at this guy and you guys, are, you guys are giving, not just listening to him, but you're giving him your hard-earned money. And he loves that. And Satan loves that you give him your hard-earned money as well. So all of these TV types, uh, we need to reject them and recognize them as false teachers today. Um, but that's thinking on the big level. That's kind of easy to pick up. We have to recognize that this, this warning comes to us in a flock as well. And so therefore... Uh, it's not just the big names, it's actually going, we need discernment as we engage with people who come to the church that not everybody is uh, of Christ, not everybody is seeking to be a part of the fellowship. There are people who come in with agendas and seek to deceive and to destroy. And uh, we've had to uh, remove people before because they were like that and that is part of being an under-shepherd of Jesus Christ to protect the flock in that regard. Um, Churches, therefore, second point, we can't just be places that accept everyone as they are. The, the, the concept of Christianity today in churches is you have to just accept everybody as they are and you're just the most loving place on the face of the planet. Now, there's some, some true aspects to that in terms of we preach a message of grace, hope and peace and love, but that comes because Jesus Christ died for our sins. So, Come as you are, but come expecting to be changed by the Lord Jesus, who will not leave you the same as you are. Um, and in addition to that, 
we're not going to let in people who come to seek and kill and destroy and then put our hands up and say, oh, we were just trying to be loving to everybody. You don't be loving and inviting to wolves. Um, if you've got a, a chook pen and you, you keep chickens and there are foxes coming, you shoot the fox. That's how it works. You don't open the gate for it and let it in and give it a bit of extra feed on the way in and throw it a couple of extra chickens, right? You, you shoot it. It has to be removed. So uh, we have to just reclaim the, the, the reality that we are to protect what we have here as the body of Christ. Come one, come all, turn to Jesus Christ and be forgiven of your sins and be changed. Yes, amen to all of that. But wisdom, discernment, guard the flock against falsehood. So church leaders, congregations can be tempted to get soft on doctrine and just aim to let everybody in with all of their various beliefs and just to get numbers and fill up the church, right? There's always a temptation there with that. Maybe over time, the wolf will just transform into a sheep. Maybe over time, they won't devour as many people as what they're devouring now. See the error here? It's a wolf. They're ravenous and we need to guard the church against such things. To be clear, the word of God, the sound teaching, um, call to the gospel, but rebuke and oppose those who come to destroy. Remove the immoral person, practice church discipline, guard against the ravenous wolf dressed up looking like sheep. My final point tonight is, as we've examined our own fruit this evening, um, we aim then to be those known to others as ones who produce good fruit. That, that here amongst the congregation, people who come to join us in the future, uh, we will know them by their fruit that they're producing. And that's not saying that everyone that's coming and that we have an idea of everyone as being perfect and they're not going to stumble. No, that's part of the sanctification process. We're stumbling, tripping and getting back up people. But at the same time, we're producing good fruit. And the fruit that we produce is shared by each other. The tree doesn't produce fruit to, to eat the fruit itself, right? <laughs> the, people don't come to church, therefore, to produce their own fruit, to go away home and enjoy their own fruit, right? You produce fruit for the benefit of your fellow, fellow believer, the fellow person, your neighbor, uh, but you produce it to serve and love your church. So we produce fruit for the good of others. And so let's examine ourselves in light of looking tonight at Galatians 5, looking at the, the warning of this producing fruit and ask ourselves the question, are we producing fruit in accordance with the word of God, in repentance and seeking after the Lord? Have I been humbled under the words of God and now desire to live according to his purposes and plans? If you have not, turn to Jesus Christ tonight. Repent of your sins. Put your trust in the Messiah. Jesus died for his people. He was raised to life. When we repent and put our trust in him, new life is granted to us. So let's pray together and uh, seek God's uh, wisdom and discernment, guidance for us as a people. Uh, Heavenly Father, we just take these words of Jesus tonight, this clear warning that is given in Scripture, and we ask that you'll help us to apply it to, uh, firstly to us as a congregation, as a, as a local body of believers. Uh, Lord, we invite, we call people to come and belong to Christ. But at the same time, Lord, may we have discernment amongst us. May we be those who are able to uh, tell the, the true Christianity comes from the fruit that is produced in the life of a believer. Help us, Lord, to uh, defend and guard against falsehood and false teaching. And Lord, as we do all of this, we recognize that we are sinners saved by the grace in Jesus Christ. And so we examine our own fruit, Lord. Help us to grow, to produce fruit, that we would produce it for the good of others around us, that we would produce the fruit of the Spirit, Lord, uh, by the work that you are doing in us. Help us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen.